Well, if you want to know what comes after that, it was this morning's scripture reading. We, uh, that didn't happen by design. That uh, just sort of turned out that way, that our scripture readings were back to back. But actually, tonight, we want to deal with a question that was put in the uh, question box. By the way, we uh, plan to finish up all the ones that have been put in there next week. Uh, not next week, in two weeks at our usual time. But this one required perhaps a little bit more explanation, and so we're devoting the whole hour to it. The question was, should we love the world? So we want to look at that tonight, and we're only going to deal with one Greek word that is translated world, and that is cosmos. Uh, you've heard that word before, I'm sure. Uh, the, the word is cosmos in the Greek, and it is used 187 times in the New Testament. Fortunately, we're not looking at each one of those this evening, uh, which would take a little bit of time. Uh, but in most of those 187 times, the uh, translation is world. Now, it possesses several meanings. I'm going to give three uh, that cover most everything. You could uh, go into some areas and probably add some, but the three main areas are, number one, the world refers to the physical, geographical earth, uh, the universe. Second, it sometimes refers to ungodliness, those who are opposed to God who live in the world, and third, simply the inhabitants of the earth, uh, humanity, for example. And we'd like to uh, deal with each one of these three as uh, they are on the sheet uh, that you uh, should have. First of all, let's deal with the world and the universe. We're just going to look at a smattering of passages, and probably most of these will be familiar. Uh, <clears throat> in Matthew 4, 8, as the devil is trying to get Jesus to sin and is tempting him, he took him to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, this is not uh, necessarily used negatively or positively. It is just simply uh, describing the fact that these are in the world. In uh, Mark 16, 16, or 15 and 16, uh, which you uh, have uh, been directed to look at a few times, I'm sure, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. The world is just simply dealing with the place in which we all live. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, uh, Paul is in a part of the world referred to as Mars Hill or the Areopagus, depending on your translation. And in verse 24, he says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And uh, so there is uh, yet another use. Moving on to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, the fact that God has made the world, the fact that this world exists, along with all the rest of the creation, tells us there is a creator. Uh, the design of the universe tells us there is a designer. It just didn't happen uh, as uh, some would try to tell us. 
Uh, but then as we go on through the New Testament, let's take a look here at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Uh, Christians were chosen before God even created the world, from the foundation of the world. That doesn't mean we were, as per uh, Calvinism, specifically individually chosen, but we were chosen as a body of people who is redeemed by Jesus. That body of people that we are part of, God had in mind from the foundation of the world. And uh, as we continue, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 20, where the apostle writes, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The plan goes way back before the creation of the world, but... That plan took a long time to be unfolded and had uh, finished being unfolded in rather recent times. Uh, and uh, especially proclaimed by this same writer on the day of Pentecost. So that's how recent all these things had been unfolded and explained to people. Uh, let's back up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse uh, 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Uh, so these are just a seven times in which we find the world referred to simply as the world. Uh, a place, a physical place in this universe that God created. However, we now find in our second definition that there uh, is much evil and a lot of that is designated by the term world. Uh, let's go back to John chapter 3 and verse 19 to start with. Uh, John chapter 3 and uh, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now we're not just dealing with the physical place we are talking about a certain kind of people who have chosen to do evil, and uh, so they are uh, worldly, and uh, it is said that the world hates the light. Well, those people who fall into this category do. Let's go on to John 15, 18 through 20 that was uh, read for us uh, just a few moments ago. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 18. If the world hates you, now it's not the planet hating you here. This is a different definition. Uh, if the world hates you, that is those who practice evil, then you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will keep yours also. And so the world hates righteousness and those who uphold righteousness, as we just read from John 3.19, uh, just before this one. The world hates righteousness. 
Here's another example of that from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. <clears throat> and this uh, has to do with Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, but moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. The fact that he was righteous and did what God said to do condemned the world because they did not want to be righteous. They did not want to be on board the ark and they resented that righteousness and this frequently happens. The world frequently hates those who are righteous because it reminds them of what they are not and what they have chosen not to be, righteous. And so there is hatred that comes forth from the world. Uh, let's move on to James chapter 1, uh, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. What is James suggesting here? The world contaminates. The world is involved in sin. The world wants you to be involved in sin and so he says, keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Don't let the world influence our thinking. Don't like the same things that the world likes if they're ungodly. Don't practice the same things that the world practices if they're ungodly. Uh, don't speak the way the world speaks when they use ungodly speech. Be different. Don't let yourself be spotted by the world. Uh, later on, James makes a uh, rather uh, bold and deliberate statement in James chapter 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, now remember he's writing to Christians, and yet he uses this terminology, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, that's very strong language, but he is trying to make a point. Now, does that mean you can't have a friend that's not a Christian? No, that's not what he's saying. Uh, hopefully, we all have friends who are not Christians. And hopefully, we will be able to encourage them to think about being Christians. But in the meantime, we don't want to become friendship with the evil practices that are in the world. And so we have a very stern warning there. Uh, next, let's go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 4. Now let's go back up to verse 2 and read the whole passage here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our, uh, Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now he's going to come back in chapter 2 and talk about those purporting to be Christians who are promoting friendship with the world. And uh, he's going to be quite explicit in that and how dangerous that is, how reckless it is, uh, how uh, threatening to the soul that is. 
But we have been delivered from these things. And uh, so uh, we should not have it in our minds to be uh, friends of the world or partake in the corruption of the world any longer. Now, uh, here comes one that uh, we oftentimes emphasize from 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 15. Do not love the world. Now, are, are we supposed to despise the planet we live on? No, this is the definition we're working with here where the world represents ungodliness. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who uh, does the will of God abides forever. So being anchored to this world and the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, these things are going to weigh us down and cause us to be lost, but there is a better option than that, and that is simply reject it. Don't love the ungodly things that are in the world. Don't participate in the ungodly things that are in the world. John goes on to say in 1 John 5, verses uh, 4 and 5, that this world is a hindrance to Christians. 1 John 5, beginning with verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even faith, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So we can overcome the world. The world is a hindrance. The world is trying to drag us down. The world wants us to be friends with the ungodly things that they participate in. But we can reject all of that and overcome the world. Now, verse 19, John also adds this. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world? Well, that's a, a little bit of a hyperbole. We do know that Jesus said that those who uh, traverse the broad way are many and those who walk the narrow way are few. Uh, so by comparison, yes, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But we do not have to be among that number because we can overcome the world through our faith. First uh, John, or uh, rather, uh, we're going to go back, I guess, to John chapter 1. Uh, and the reason is to show the shift that occurs here because we have both definitions involved in a passage of Scripture. John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> John still follows Luke, doesn't he? Yeah, there it is, okay. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 9, uh, that was the true light which gives light to everyone coming into the world. Now there is a geographic description, coming into the world, this place upon which we live. He came on, uh, uh, verse 10, he was in the world, that is this physical place, and the world was made through him, and the world knew him not. So we have a subtle shift from the geographical place to the world becoming a place of ungodly people. The first three times it's mentioned, it's talking about the geographical place. 
but the world knew him not, is getting over to that part of the definition where the ungodly people are. And so we have that shift in that passage. Now, one more passage on this, John chapter 17, verses 14 through 18. This is part of Jesus' prayer on the night he was betrayed, his prayer for his disciples. And he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. Again, the definition we've been discussing here. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That is, they don't have the same love. They don't have the same uh, connection uh, to the ungodliness that is in the world, just like Jesus says, I don't have that connection. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. There we have a physical definition involved but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your, your truth. Your word is truth. And uh, as you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. So we end up back as a geographic place. So we see that the world, word world is oftentimes even in the same passage used with two different definitions, the first two that we've been dealing with. But now we want to go to the third one. And uh, this will answer, complete answering the question that was asked. First of all, we want to go to John 3, 16 and 17. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, this is not dealing with the geographic place, is it? And this is not dealing with the ungodliness in the world either, is it? This is dealing with humanity, with people, uh, and not necessarily in either a positive or negative way, just dealing with the people who live here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So we see two senses uh, again in which the word world is used even in the same passage. Uh, John chapter 12 and verse 47 also uh, points out that Jesus came into the world as a Savior. John 12, verse 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now later on, of course, Jesus will judge the world, as we learn in John chapter 5 and verse 27. But he did not come to judge the world at his first coming. He came as a savior of the world. To those who reject him, he will later on become the judge. First uh, John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. All people, the entire humanity, everybody has an opportunity to be saved. Jesus died that everyone could be saved. Is everyone going to be saved? No, Jesus already told us that in Matthew 7. The majority of people are going to reject the offer. But he died so that everyone could be saved from sin. Uh, 1 John chapter 4 and uh, verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son uh, as Savior of the world. Uh, let's back up to Romans uh, chapter 11. 
and verse 15, this uh, desire to save the world also involves reconciliation. Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. For if uh, their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be from light, but life from the dead? And there are other passages that show that Jesus came to reconcile man to God. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, you'll remember that Jesus taught, I am the light of the world. All living beings, all humanity, everybody on this planet has Jesus as the light of the world. Now that's what we were dealing with earlier when we read that people prefer darkness. Many people in the world prefer darkness. But Jesus came to be the light of the world and is still there for people to see and follow. Likewise, Matthew 5, 14, Christians are to shine as light in the world. They are to be the salt of the earth and also the light of the world. And then uh, finally, we come to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, which is uh, somewhat of a response to the fact that Jesus left heaven, came to earth, lived as a man, gave up his deity, emptied himself at least, and uh, humbled himself and became obedient even to the cross. And But after that, we read in verse uh, 15 of uh, Philippians 2, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of the crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So that is our responsibility. This is what is involved in loving the world. We all live on the geographical place called the world. We all uh, are aware that there is a lot of evil and wickedness in the world, which is referred to as the world sometimes, or worldliness. But we also realize that Jesus loved people, and while we ought not to love the world, we ought to love those who are in the world who have sins that need to be forgiven. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to accomplish that task. And then we are to shine as lights. Jesus is, not, is the light, of course, but he shouldn't be the only light that people see. People should see Christians as lights in the world also, shining for them to see, to bring them to Christ, who is the light of the world. So we are not obviously to love evil, but we are to love those who sometimes choose to practice it and to try and be lights to show them something better, to show them salvation. And of course, we urge all to repent of their sins. All of the things in the world are, are basically worthless. What if you gained the whole world and lost your own soul? Jesus asked. The things in the world, e even the legitimate things in the world are not worth losing salvation over. And so uh, that's our message and it's our message tonight also. If you have never come to the light of the world... Why don't you decide now to do that if you've repented of your sins? If you haven't repented, it won't do you any good. You have to be willing to give up sin and not be a friend of the world, but to give up the sins that put Jesus on the cross. And you can do that because Jesus already said, He who believed and is baptized shall be saved. So if you've never been baptized... 
That's something you need to give serious thought to. If you're ready, we can do that tonight. If you're not, then you need to study more and we're willing to help you there also. If you're already a child of God and you've departed from the faith, the world is not worth it. All that's there is wickedness and evil. That's not going to help you now or in eternity. And so please come back to your first love. If we can help you in any of these ways, let us know while we stand and while we sing.